get to offer two texts for this morning. One, where is he that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. In the second verse of the second chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Sixth verse of the 11th chapter of the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well now, this very familiar story of the three kings coming at what we call the time of Epiphany, the manifestation of Christ to the world, to the Gentiles in particular, we might wonder who these people were. They were outlanders, they were foreigners, they were not Hebrews. They were scientists, they knew how to read the stars and evidently they knew something quite a lot about Hebrew history. And somehow they had put it together that from their reading of the stars that there was a sign in the heavens that the Messiah was to be born. We can have no doubt about this. They knew that he was to be born, who was to be king over Israel. And we will see from all that they did that they must have known that it wasn't just any old ordinary king, that this was a king different in kind from all others that had gone before. In fact, that he was God. And I'm looking ahead, but we'll, we'll see from what is said about these wise men that they believed all this. If you say, well, they were astrologers. Well, they may have been astrologers. Astrologers are those who read the stars to find meanings in it. They were astronomers. They're astronomers to read the stars to see if they can understand the movements of the stars, to, to reconstruct the history of their movements, and to predict their movements in the future, and to see what interrelations these stars have with one another, and how they move, and what they do. That's astronomy. And you'd say, well, they were astronomers then. Well, I wouldn't doubt that, but they were one, they were one great deal more than astrologers or astronomers. Look, they, if they were either one or the other, what would their response have been when somebody asked them what they came for, what they made this trip for? They would say, if they were astronomers, they would say, well, we had a theory that we were interpreting the stars there and they were gonna mean that the Christ child was born here and we just wanted to come and see if it was true if our theory proved out all right or not. And sure enough, when we see, that, see it true, uh, we can take heart and congratulate ourselves on having worked out this theory. It proves that we were right. Our astronomical predictions came true. They didn't say any of that. They had no such thought before they even started on their trip. They knew that the Christ child was born. They had gifts all prepared to take with them, to give to him. They had no doubt he was there. They had no doubt he was worthy of these gifts. They had no doubt that the significance and the meaning of gifts like this pertained to him and his calling. And all this they knew two years before they saw him. Remember, Herod asked them, how long ago did the star first appear? And it was based on their answer that Herod decided which children he needed to murder. He chose all the ones that were two years old and younger. Doesn't that show you that they told Herod that they saw the star two years ago? So when they came and brought their gifts, they had been at this for two years. They didn't come to Herod and to Jerusalem and say, okay, where is this person? 
Uh, we think there's a king to be born. Is that true? Is he somewhere around here? No. They said, show us where he is. They knew he was born. They only asked where. That's all. And it may have been astonishing to them, must have been, that Jerusalem was so asleep to this, so ignorant of it. They knew nothing about it. In any case, they knew, and from what we can tell from the text, they probably didn't see the star once they got into Jerusalem. Because there, they went to King Herod to say, where, where, where is this child? See, if they had seen the star then, they wouldn't have needed to ask him, would they? So something had lapsed, apparently, in their vision of the star that made them end up asking Herod. And thus is all in God's providence. And so Herod joined, gathered the priests and scribes and said, tell us where the king is to be born, the Messiah to be born. And they said, Bethlehem of Judea. And so the wise men then said, well, we'll go there then. And you know the story, you just heard it. But Herod said, bring me word again when you find him so I can worship too, which was a lie. But they didn't know that. So they went. And then it says, as they went, they saw the star again. And they rejoiced with exceeding great joy when the star appeared. And this time it was very specific. It wasn't just up in the heavens somewhere, but it was connected to a place on earth. It was in the direction of Bethlehem. And when they got the direct to Bethlehem, it was in the direction of the particular building, the house where Jesus and his mother were. It was so clear that this star was more than just a conjunction of planets or something in the sky, that it was something much closer to earth because it pointed out the very house that they should go to. They didn't have to ask anybody. And here again, you, you can see that they knew that they were coming to worship the king and the Messiah, the son of God, God himself incarnate, they knew that because what did they do when they came in? They didn't look around and say, this doesn't look like a very regal setting to me. Are we in the right place? No, they instantly fell down and worshiped him. Regardless of all appearances, they knew that he was the one prophesied. They knew that he was God. When, he, when they went to see Herod, did they fall down and worship Herod? No. It doesn't even say they, they made any obeisance to him. They certainly honored him, but they didn't fall down and worship him. Yet he was the king of Judea, appointed by the Romans, albeit, but nevertheless, he was the reigning king. But when they saw this little child, two years old, they fell down and worshipped. They knew he was God incarnate or they would not have worshipped him. And they would not have brought gifts that so signified unless they knew it. They would not have even made this trip and forecast what it would involve if they hadn't believed it from the beginning. They were a lot more than astronomers. They were God seekers. And they were a lot more than God seekers. They were Christ seekers. The Spirit led them to this. It was God's purpose to manifest his Son to the Gentiles. And he did it perfectly. He made no mistake. He left no mistake in their minds. They knew what had been revealed to them. And they acted exactly in accordance with people who knew they were worshiping God the Son. And their gifts showed it as well. This is, you could say, conjecture, but it fits perfectly that gold represented the royalty of the king. Incense represented a deity. Incense is only offered to a god. And all the world knew that. Even the pagan emperor of Rome knew that. And he required that people... Christians included, offer incense to him because he claimed to be a deity. And that's where Christians 
incurred the death penalty for not doing that. They wouldn't offer incense to a human pretending that he was God. Yet these wise men of the same understanding offered incense to him. They knew he was God. And they offered myrrh because myrrh signified the, the anointing of a dead body. They knew that he came to offer his life a sacrifice for the redemption of fallen man. That's the definition of Messiah from the scriptures. Even though the Hebrews didn't know it, others could read their scriptures too. And Isaiah 53 is full of exactly that. The Messiah was to be a sin offering for his people to lay down his life in payment of their sins and to save them by his death. It's all there in the Old Testament. Now, the interesting thing is that these, that these foreigners, these outlanders, informed by the Holy Ghost and led to a Christian search of, for, the, for the Messiah and finding him and worshiping him, are doing exactly what every Christian is called to do, to search God's treasures diligently. Why? Because he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. As St. Paul said, without faith it is impossible to please God. For the he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Doesn't that fit exactly what the wise men were doing? They believed that God is. And they believed he was a rewarder of them if they would diligently search for him, which took them two years to do, and they faithfully performed it. And now what are Christians to be doing? They are to be feeding on these treasures of God wherever they can find them. And scripture is a very good place to do that feeding. They joined, the, the, the uh, wise men joined, in fact, set an example for Christians, that this is what Christians ought to be doing. They should be examining all the great things of God, looking into them. Listen to what Peter says in, in, the, in his first epistle, verses 10 through 12. It's a long, convoluted sentence, you might say. But what he's saying is, in there, in summary, is that the angels even desire to look into the things which the prophets searched into diligently. And what was that? The prophets searched into the salvation which was promised and questioned when it was to be. And they learned from the Spirit that it was not to be in their day, but in later days to others who would come and see this salvation presented to them. And then it says, which things the angels desire to look into. This is fascinating. The Old Testament prophets searched diligently to find out what God's plans were, and he re rewarded them with an insight into it. And it says the angels even long to look into these things. Where are we, Christians? Shouldn't we be spending our time doing the same thing? Look into the salvation provided, prophesied. Look into the sufferings of Christ that are prophesied and the glory that should follow. When Jesus spoke with the Old Testament figures in the transfiguration on the mountain, he was speaking with Moses and Elijah, representatives of the law. What did they speak about? St. Luke's Gospel is the only one that tells us. It was in the 31st verse of the ninth chapter of St. Luke. They spoke of his death that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. His sacrificial death was a subject matter which Moses and Elijah were intimately concerned in. And, he, and they were discussing it with Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. The psalmist says that the statutes of the Lord are a delight Psalm 119, verse 47. My delight is in thy commandments, which I have loved. And the Proverbs 
Two four says, seek wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as silver. And when you search for them as for hid treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the Lord. Proverbs 2 4. And in Matthew 13 44, Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven like treasure hidden in a field, which when a man finds, he hides it. And for joy he goes and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field so that he can have that treasure that's hidden there. Jesus put himself, put it that way. We're just search for him as hidden treasure. Peter, in his first epistle, said in the second chapter, second verse, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. He didn't say newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. He says, as they do, do you also desire it? It's a command. It's an imperative. Desire, hunger for, yearn for, long for the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If you have tasted that the Lord is good. Yes, that's what Christians should be about. As newborn babes desire milk, we should be desiring the word because we can feed on it, because it delights him and us to be involved in this, because we'll find in it such delights as pass our understanding. It's not just future rewards we're looking for, but we can have present de time delight in this when we search scriptures, make it a habit to do this. That's the subject matter, after all, of so many of these sermons that you've hear heard in recent times here. We're always searching the scriptures to find those things that delight us. That's what we were made to do. Just like the sheep was made, to graze in that green meadow. God made the sheep and he made the grass and he made the crystal clear stream running by the meadow and he made it all pure and good and he put a hunger in that sheep for that grass and the sheep doesn't know it but it's a sign of exactly what we should be doing and that sheep grazes all day long on the green grass beside that clear stream trusting and the God that put him there, that this food is good and it will feed me and I'll keep feeding on it. And it's all I care about. Nothing else. Just feeding on it always because it's good. What, a, what a, an excellent, uh, you might say, parable or symbol that Jesus created in that for us. The sheep safely grazing. He shall make me lie down in green pastures, lead me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, for his name's sake. The, the simile, the metaphor of being a sheep is of God's own making. You know, even scientists of later years, the astronomers, and during the Christian era of science back in the Middle Ages, when the astronomers were Christians as well as astronomers. When they studied the stars, they, it delighted them. You remember Johannes Kepler? They, dis, they discovered the laws of the movements of planets in their orbits. And he made this comment that you can still find on, on the computer. If you look today, it'll cite Johannes Kepler saying this. I have attested it as true in my inmost soul. And I contemplate his beauty with incredible and ravishing delight. He's describing God's handiwork in the stars and the planets. And he says it delights him to see it. And can we not find similar delight in seeing how everything he prophesied comes together in scripture? Jeremiah God says this by his prophet. He says, Let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, 
judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. He's inviting people, in fact, commanding them. If you have anything that you're interested in finding, searching out, and getting the knowledge and understanding of, let it be God, because there you'll find treasures that are beyond belief for their greatness and their beauty. There's one of those gospel hymns that is called The Sweet Prospect. And it's, it's a shape note carol. And its words were sung by our American frontier ancestors long ago. And it says this, On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Oh, the transporting rapturous scene that rises to my sight, sweet fields arrayed in living green and rivers of delight. This is what awaits the one who waits on the Lord and searches him out and does what the angels do, desire to look into the things that pertain to him. It's all about your destiny and mine. Do you care enough to open the book that's full of the treasures about your destiny and mine and search it diligently and delight in it and praise God in it? Isaac Watts put it this way, one of his hymns, paraphrasing the 23rd Psalm. O oh, may thy house be mine abode, and all my work be praise to the outsider, to the worldly. That's idiocy. To the Christian, it's our destiny. It's our future. And to the wise men, it was all their trouble and all their concern and all their energy and effort and all their delight and all their risk of loss and danger in a two-year trek to find this king that they believed in and to worship him. And now we may wonder, then, shouldn't we also see in Jesus himself that, was a special, that which is especially inviting, that which justifies God's efforts in drawing people from all over the world to come and seek him, to manifest himself to the Gentiles as something worth their attention? Certainly, he was no ordinary king. He was different from all other kings. He was especially different from the law of the Old Testament, out of which and from under which he came. In the Garden of Eden, man chose, instead of listening and following the word of God, chose to run the risk of the curse. Eve didn't believe that there was a curse. Found out otherwise. But Adam knew it. He wasn't deceived. And he chose to run that risk anyway. To live in fear of the curse. In fear of it. In hope of evading it. In hope of putting it off. He took it on. And lived under that curse. That was a worse sin perhaps than being deceived in the first place as Eve was. But they both fell. And God, through his mercy, encountered that curse for us. That's the only way out of it. The law is a curse. The law is not to be kept by us. It can't be. It's impossible. It's to be kept, but we, can't, we are incapable of it. The law is to make a difference between right and wrong and to punish the wrong. And by doing this, to preach Christ as the Redeemer that gets us out of the curse. Because we cannot get out of it by going through the law. We'll always enter that and encounter that curse. And Jesus Christ, being sinless, could face it. And so in his mercy, he did so. And this is the unique thing about him and his kingship. He faced death and the curse 
that is called the sting of death by Paul in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 57 in that range. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Those mysterious words. I had a worldling ask me one time, I've heard that verse, I don't know what it means. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. If he had studied, he would have found it out. He perhaps should be studying it, because there, the sting of death is its curse. The curse is this. Death is the penalty for what you've done breaking the law, and you're going to die. And when you die, you die because you deserve it. It is right for you to to die because you deserve death because you broke the law. That's the sting, the curse that says death is right for you because of breaking the law. And it's the law that makes it a sin. So you see, the law declares what a sin is, and then committing the sin subjects you to the curse of the law for breaking it. But Jesus took that curse out of it took the sting out of death because he satisfied the curse. Being mortal, submitted to it. And the curse runs to the point of death. It accomplishes the death of a sinner, the death of a mortal. When the mortal has been killed, the curse is ended and satisfied. And if you were killed justly, you have no life hereafter either. That's called the second death because you deserved to die. But Christ didn't deserve to die, so there was no second death for him. In fact, death, the first death was reversed because of that. And he's the only one that could do that in all history, in all the universe, in all of time, in all of eternity. He took the sting out of death. And now the people under the law We're always living in this state of mind. If we don't do what the law says, we face the curse. And the curse inflicts a penalty on us. And that penalty might be a monetary fine, as it sometimes was. It might be the lash or the rod, whatever it it was they used to administer a beating in those times. Or it might be the death penalty. And ultimately it was death for the most fundamental of the laws. And Jesus faced all three of those. He came to this world poor, though he was rich. He was penniless here in this life. They couldn't get any money out of him. They could kill him, but, and they could beat him, and they did. But he could face that because it wasn't with a curse that pertained to him. He was accepting that curse and letting it destroy his body so that the curse would be spent on him and not available to the rest of us if we identify with him. That is the unique thing about Jesus. Makes him differ from every king through time and eternity. Makes him worth showing to the Gentiles. Makes him worth all our study, all our diligent searching to find out his wonders and his delights that he has waiting for us. He has made it so we can face death, which we must, because these temples that we live in have been defiled, and corruption cannot inherit incorruption. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, our mortal must, must put on immortality, our corruptible must put on incorruption, and then he prophesies the changing of our mortal nature to an immortal one and our corruptible nature to an incorruptible, which will be necessary before we can see heaven, before we can join our Redeemer in heaven and our fellow Christians who have joined him before us in heaven. We must go through the departing of our soul from this defiled temple of the body. But it's not facing the sting of death. If you're with Christ, he's taken that out of it. We can face death now, not fearing it like our ancestors did, afraid of the whip, afraid of the lash, afraid of death, 
Because, because why? Because it would be a righteous judgment against them who would condemn them to hell as well as to the grave. They had good reason to fear. But the sting is taken out by Christ. And now we face death merely as a replacement of our defiled bodies by an incorruptible body. So we can join him in heaven. The world doesn't understand it. How Christians cannot fear death. But self-denial is a form of death every day. And we're called to take up our cross daily and follow him. We're to walk the road to our death every day. Calvary every day. Submitting spiritually to the forsaking of our lives in order to find them again in him. To lose life in order to find it. That's our command. That's our destiny. And we lose it knowing that Jesus has taken the sting out of it. And that it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. This has set up a new hierarchy in the world. And that hierarchy is no longer one of rich versus poor or strong versus weak. It is this. Sinless versus sinner. And Jesus Christ is the only one on the side of the sinless until you join him in faith. And then you're on his side. And so there's the new hierarchy, the new verticality between Christ, the sinless, and everyone else. And that puts all the rest of the world on an even plane. And that's why Jesus said, call no man father. For one foot there was, you have one father, even God. But be not many masters, for you have one master, even Christ. He said this in Matthew 23, 9 and 10. Because that's the new hierarchy. In relation to God, the Son, all are on the same plane because all are sinners. That's the hierarchy. Christ and all the rest. And all the rest are sinners, and they're therefore all equal in the sight of God, equal as sinners. He doesn't mean there are actually no differences between people. There are. But the one that matters is the one between righteous and sinner. And it's our business to identify with the righteous one and to spend all our diligence seeking him out and delighting in his revelations and his feeding. And that's what we're doing today in this service. The sacrament is a feeding upon him. We don't feed on the sacrament. The sacrament is a picture of us feeding on the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the Word, our food. That's the reality of what we feed upon. And let us take it in that spirit. All praise and thanks to thee, O God, for inspiring the Gentiles to true faith in thee by leading them with a star to thy Son, Jesus Christ. Mercifully grant us the like diligence that we may seek and find thy many loving and saving purposes towards us and all thy saved ones, now and forever. For in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.